I'm Stephen Booth, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Stephen Booth. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I'm your host, Hank Garner. You can find all of the archives of the show over at hankgarner.com. When you're there, click on the links in the right-hand sidebar to subscribe to the show. I'd like to thank some sponsors for making today's show possible. First off is George Weir with his book, Jim of Sky, book one of the Factions of Sky series. Jim is an orphan living in the floating city of Cirrus. As the dreaded horn attack, Jim and his friends are scooped up in an adventure of a lifetime when the floating orphanage Janus is destroyed. Not only must Jim, Crowen, and a mech named Goat survive aboard a horn capital ship, but they must find a way to save each other and all of Sky. In order to do so, Jim and his friends soon find themselves in the crosshairs of the two greatest fleets ever assembled, with a battle coming that may bring nightfall upon Earth forever. But there's a hope and a well-kept secret buried beneath a mountain far below in the land left devastated by the 200-year-old Holocaust. Jim of Sky, book one of the Factions of Sky by George Weir. There's a link to it in the show notes. And thanks to Patricia Gilliam for sponsoring the show. Her book, Out of the Gray, which is the first book in the Hanaria series. Uh, you really want to pick this up. Aliens, Politics, and Murder. Only the first one is new. This is such a fantastic series, and you can get in on the uh, the beginning of the series right now with book one, Out of the Gray. The Hanaria series is one of my favorite series from one of my favorite writers. You're really going to love what Patricia's doing. Uh, thank you to Patricia for sponsoring the show. Also, at the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Stephen Booth on the show with me today. Stephen has a brand new book that's been out for a couple of days now. It's called Dead in the Dark. It's the latest Cooper and Fry mystery uh, in that series, and I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, Welcome to the show, Stephen. Uh, Thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, It's great to have you. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, um, it's so long ago. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Those those are the best ones. (laughs) Pretty much as soon as I could read, I started to write stories. People often ask me now, you know, how old were you when you started writing? I can't remember. Because I was so young. And in fact, I I ended up writing my first novel when I was 12 years old, which, when I think back now, is just amazing, really, that I did that. And I knew from that moment when I finished that first novel at the age of 12, I knew that was what I wanted to do when I grew up. So I've, I've never been in any doubt really, that's how I was going to be a writer. Was there anything before age 12 uh, that uh, that you realized that, that there was the, the storyteller spark uh, in you? Uh, you know, because uh, that's that's not a, a typical thing that 12-year-olds do, is sit down and write a novel. <laughs> were, no, were, you a, fact, were you a bookish you know, kid? I, I came from a very working-class family. And, okay. Uh, my parents didn't even read books. Um, so this instinct to write doesn't exist anywhere in my family, as far as I'm aware. But it, it just seemed to be a natural step for me from reading other people's stories to writing my own. Um, there was no sort of thought process involved in it. I think this is what I'll do. I just sat down and started writing. Um, my parents thought there was something wrong with me, you know, because it was so alien to them this idea of writing stories but it was obviously some very deep instinct which you know i I couldn't have resisted right 
Um, Stephen, you, you you talked about coming from a working class family, and, and your parents were were not readers. Uh, that is uh, sadly the um, I, I think the the predominance of of people's experience these days. And uh, coming from the states and, and talking to someone from uh, from the United Kingdom uh, like you, uh, a lot of Americans have this idea that. Uh, uh, that English people uh, must just, you know, sit around reading the classics all day. I mean, you know, they're you, it's it's your language for God's sake, you know. And so, you know, uh, that's a that's probably an alarming thing for some people to hear. That, that it, it you guys helps. are a lot like us. <laughs> I'm afraid we are. Yes, it's you know, it, it just isn't true. You have this image of English people, I suppose, but you know, we a lot of people just don't read books anymore. And that always has been the case, but I think it's more so now with the predominance of, you know, television and the internet. Um, I don't think people have the, uh, the concentration or the patience to sit down with the book anymore. Sadly, you know, it's very sad. It is very um, sad. Because for me, I've, I've always been a reader from being, you know, a very small child. And I think reading a book a novel in particular is a very different experience from all those other, you know, watching things on the screen because the story is going on inside your head in your imagination. And I think it's a much more personal and intimate experience, which people are missing out on. Well, and, and not to even mention uh, the fact that if you take a book and, um, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, uh, use that material to make a, a, a television show or a, a movie. There, there are things that are just going to be left out. Uh, you know, how do you how do you translate the the protagonist inner monologue? How do you uh, how do you include all of the fantastic details that that you just cannot uh, when when translating that to screen? It just doesn't happen. It, it's not possible. I mean, I, you know, I've spent quite a few years talking to um, TV producers and uh, scriptwriters. And I've become very aware of all the all the compromises and the changes that would have to be made, you know, to get a book onto screen. And they just cannot do what I do in a book. It just isn't possible. It's just not. And uh, the the thing that aggravates me the most is you you ask someone, uh, "Have you read this book?" And they say, "Oh, I saw the movie." And I just, I was, God, that is not the same. <laughs> not, it, it, it might it, is, it, it might be it a great possible. supplement. It is quite frustrating as a writer, yeah. you know, and people, the question I get probably asked most often is, uh, have your books been on TV or are they going to be on TV? It, it's almost as if that's a validation right. for a lot of people. The fact it exists as a book isn't important, but if it's been on TV, that right. makes it something somehow worthwhile. It's very frustrating yeah. as a writer. Well, the, the answer to that is, no, my books are better than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think it's true. Almost I, always, the book it is. is it is. It is. It's just. It's you know. And uh, you know, the, a movie might be a good supplement to it, but it's never a replacement. Never a replacement. The, the only thing that really tempts me about um, TV, in particular, is it, it would bring more people to the books once they've sure. seen them on TV. They want to read the books. Yeah. Um, so that, I know. Yeah, my friend Craig Johnson, who writes the uh, the Longmire mystery oh, yeah. series, uh, his books were translated and in, in obviously to a, a very popular television show uh, that that then you know picked up uh, from uh, from Netflix and had a whole other life. And uh, I think he would argue that 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 television series has been very good for his career. Um, but you know, he, he also is very quick to say the television series and the books are. Two different things. They mm. they do not exist in the same, uh, you know, plane of reality. They're they're you have to, uh, you know, realize that they're two different things. They you can't bring your expectations from one to the other. I've always felt uh, very ambivalent about you know plans to make a Cooper and Fry TV series because I feel very close to my characters, my two protagonists, Ben Cooper and Diane Fry. I've written you know seventeen, eighteen books about them now. I know them so well, and I'm very clear in my, own, in my own mind what they're like and what they look like. And and I, I've never felt that I would really want to watch it on TV because it wouldn't be my characters anymore. 
it would be it would be a screenwriter's interpretation of your characters, mm-hmm. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Very um, odd thing. Very, very odd thing. Very <laughs> odd thing. Well, um, I I, I want to dig pretty deep into Cooper and Fry, but before we do that, um, what when you wrote that novel at twelve, uh, what what types of uh, or what type of story was that, and and what was your 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 kind of go to genre that that really excited you? I was writing in those days. I was writing science fiction. Okay. Um, it was what I was reading a lot at that age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in my defense, it was the 1960s. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, people were landing on the moon. You know, it was what yeah. we were all. It was what we were all talking about and and thinking about. So um, science fiction, I, I found fascinating at that age. And you know, I sat down and wrote the sort of story that I enjoyed reading. But over the years, I've you know become a big fan of crime fiction and, and mystery novels. So, what do you think it is, Stephen, for you uh, that uh, that excites you about crime fiction and that that gets your interest peaked? Uh, you know, I, I think the great thing about crime fiction is that you can write about anything, any subject which interests you, excites you, frightens you, worries you. You can write about it in a crime novel, but still have a great story that's going to make people want to read through to the end of the book. You know, you can follow characters over a series of novels. You can explore a, a place like the, the Peak District setting that I write about. You can do anything in a crime novel, and people do. It's such a wide genre that I think anybody could find something that interests them in crime fiction. And I I hear that quite a lot from readers, you know, when I'm I'm doing events and signings. Somebody will say, well, you know, I I, I don't read crime fiction usually, but I picked up one of your books and I enjoyed it. You know, they have that sort of sense of surprise (laughs) that they enjoyed a crime novel. And I think it's just a question of finding the right book for readers to get that entry into the genre. Right. Um, I, I've heard people say that too. I don't. I don't read crime fiction, and uh, and I was like, well, I, I bet you do, um, and you just don't realize <laughs> it sometimes because, like you said, it, it can take the shape of uh, of so many genres and settings, and uh, I, I think that's why crime fiction and uh, thrillers and uh, kind of that those uh, you know books with that tone are so. Uh, just on fire popular right now is is because yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, we can set them anywhere we want and and really look at every aspect of life and see kind of the the darker nature uh, of ourselves and 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 that uh experience and i think in a way um we've always been writing crime fiction haven't we we might have called it something different but if you think about some of shakespeare's plays think about um hamlet or macbeth they're basically murder mysteries, aren't they? Yes, they are. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> People yeah. have always written about those those subjects. I, I can remember as a child, and um, this is really odd when I think about it, you know, we had a big um, Bible in our household when I was growing up. Right. And I knew the Old Testament very well. So some great stories in the Old Testament. Sure. And I remember one about um, Daniel. Uh, the book of Daniel, he was an advisor to, uh, was it King Nebuchadnezzar? One of yes. Those. And he actually tells a story about um, one of the first uses of forensic evidence when he spread flour on the floor of the temple. Yes. To catch out, to catch out the priests who were stealing the food that had been put down for the, <laughs> for the God. I had forgotten about that. That's uh, amazing. Right in the Old Testament. Well, I mean, that's, you know, classic crime right. novel. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I, I like to say that, uh, that even the Bible, the, the opening, uh, the opening book, uh, it has a, uh, has a murder mystery when you've got Cain and Abel. I mean, we, 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 we start the thing with, with murder, you know, <laughs> and then, and then yeah. we expect life to be different, you know. <laughs> but, and I think it's, it's an endlessly fascinating subject for people because it, the psychology of it is so interesting. Um, you know, why did that happen? What happened in that relationship for that to be the outcome? And that's that's what I'm writing about, I think. Right, right. Uh, well, 
at, at what point um, did you realize that uh, that you were going to uh, to do this for a living? That that uh, that you were going to be a crime writer? And were were Cooper and Fry your your first uh, foray into professional writing? Well, I, in fact, I always have been a writer because I I figured out even as a teenage boy that the way to earn a living by writing was to be a newspaper journalist because that's what they seem to do. Right. And that was, actually, that was actually my first job as a newspaper reporter. And I did that for quite a number of years before I became a full-time novelist. So, in fact, I've always written for a living. I've never done anything else but writing and some editing. That's fantastic. Uh, which, is, which is astonishing, really, that I was able to do that. Um, but I, I fell out of love with, with journalism. The newspaper business had changed so much over the years that I decided I wanted to get out and of course I knew exactly what I wanted to do and I did write several other novels which I couldn't get published um, they just sat in a drawer and most of them still are sitting in that drawer now <laughs> and I think a lot I of wrote, us have those <laughs> until I wrote the right book and I look back on those as my just my practice novels you know it was just a question of getting the right voice the right style the right subject matter the right characters and it all came together in that first cooper and fry novel black dog it was called and everything seemed to work in that book and i knew that was going to be the one uh steven i've talked to a number of uh, crime fiction writers thriller writers um suspense writers and uh, a lot of them have a background in journalism and uh, and uh, uh, like you a lot of them say that they left journalism because uh, it changed the uh, the uh, the culture of journalism changed the the business of journalism changed uh, what was it for you that uh, turned you off um, there were several things I think actually uh, um, I worked almost all of my career for local newspapers and I loved the idea of being part of the community, you know, and actually doing something to help a, a place and working somewhere where everybody knew who you were and valued what you did. And that's certainly in the UK, that's changed completely now. Um, all local newspapers, those that are still surviving because a lot have disappeared now are all owned by the big publishing corporations and that's a very different experience. I didn't like working in the corporate world at all. Uh, and the standards of journalism had changed at the same time. You know, I was um, when I was trained, the three words that we learned by heart were accuracy, fairness and balance. And <laughs> I, I feel such like, you know, so old school now, even using those words, because I, I don't think that exists anymore in journalism. Uh, I, we, yeah, our, our local uh, you know, small town paper was bought out by a corporate entity several years ago. And uh, we, uh, my wife and I, uh, realized not long ago, we, we went down to the newspaper uh, for some reason and, and realized that we don't even run our own printing press anymore. Uh, it's oh, uh, the, the papers are printed in, a, in another city and trucked in overnight. And I was just like, wow, that's what a, what a travesty. Not, not only are we mostly recycling, you know, national and world news in the paper, uh, but, you know, we're not even printing the paper here anymore. And it's, it's, it's a sad situation. Yeah, many of the papers I, I worked for, they, they no longer even have an office in the, in the town they serve. You know, they're, they're run from somewhere else, as you say. And everything's been centralized so much that, you know, my job disappeared very quickly, not long after I left um, the newspaper industry. You know, that, that job doesn't exist anymore. So goodness knows what I'd be doing now if it hadn't been for Cooper and Fry. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, do you feel like your time as a journalist uh, helped you in writing fiction? Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the journal, journalists have this great um, job in that you, you kind of show up to report 
on something and you tell the story of what happened to to the readers that weren't there. And, you know, a, a good journalist looks for the things other people don't see. Uh, was that your experience? And do you feel like that time equipped you to be a fiction writer? Oh, absolutely. I think I think it was the best training I could have had for my future career writing, writing novels. Um, you learn so much, just practical things like working to deadlines or about being edited. It's one of the reasons that um, you know, book publishers love working with former journalists because they understand about the editing process. Um, but I, I thought it was a great privilege as a young man when I was a you know, trainee newspaper reporter just to be able to to meet people from all walks of life, from different uh, age groups and backgrounds from myself, who I might otherwise never have had the chance to meet. You know, on a local paper, you'd be sent out to cover something like, oh, I don't know, um, a 90th birthday or um, a diamond wedding celebration, you know. And you would sit down in someone's house, somebody from a different generation from you, and listen to them talk about their lives, about what it was like growing up at the end of the last century or how they met during the First World War. It was all fascinating to me. That insight into other people's lives was a, was a great privilege, I thought. And one of the other things you learn as a journalist, and <laughs> this is quite funny really, is that um, most journalists don't really know anything about any subject, um, but they have to learn the trick of being able to write about something that they know nothing about, but sound as though they do. To convince exactly. the reader, you have to convince the reader that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Which is just like a fiction writer. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm still doing that now. Right. Uh, you know, that, that trick that I learned as a journalist. Um, and it's amazing how well that works. Uh, you know, Hank, just using a few small details, some facts that you've picked up by asking somebody and using them in a confident way that makes you sound as though you, you know what you're doing. <laughs> right. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I very love convincing. It. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so funny. Um, tell me about Cooper and Fry. Where, where did these two uh, characters uh, come from? And uh, did you have any idea... Uh, in the beginning, that that these characters would have such staying power? Uh, no, not at all. Um, I said I'd written several other novels, which were all um, one-offs, you know, just standalones. And I didn't know that Black Dog was going to be any different, that first Cooper and Fry novel. But what I did, uh, you know, I'd, I'd been a huge fan of crime fiction for many years by that point. So I'm, I'm going back to the 1990s now. And I'd noticed in a lot of the series that I was reading, the central character, the protagonist, always seemed to be some uh, world-weary, middle-aged, semi-alcoholic loner, certainly in British, British crime fiction. Anybody who reads British, <laughs> British crime novels will know who I'm talking about. Um, there seemed to be a lot of them. So, and always a man. And I decided to make my characters young and junior police officers just as a reaction to what I was reading so that my book was different from what everybody else was writing. So Ben and Diane are in their 20s at the start of the series and they're both, uh, their rank is Detective Constable which is the bottom rung of the ladder in, in the British detective uh, ranking. So that gave me quite a different perspective on a murder investigation you know they weren't in charge they were just the, the foot soldiers if you like doing what they were told and I think that was one of the things that made my book different from what was being published at that time I mean the young junior officers um, so that was uh, I created them as a, as a response to, to what I was reading the rest of them the all their personalities, their characters, their backgrounds, their families and who they are only came to me as I was writing about them. I discovered who those two characters were during the course of writing that, that first book. 
And the amazing thing was that they came alive so much to me off the page when I started to write about them. It was quite different from the experience I'd had writing those earlier novels. Those those two made all the difference. And by the time I got to the end of that first book, I knew there was far more I wanted to say about those two characters than I could possibly get into the one book. And that's how I knew that I had the potential for a series. The... Um uh, the idea that these characters were, were young and fresh, uh, on the job, uh, I, I think it was, a, is really a, a game changer because the, the, the idea of the, the older, grizzled, uh, jaded detective who's seen it all, who's experienced it all, uh, it has almost become a trope of, of, uh, you know, detective mysteries. Um, you know, even some of our most beloved characters are really, really flawed people, um, who, who do these good things almost in spite of themselves. Uh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> having, having characters that, uh, that have a, uh, a fresh, uh, outlook and, and haven't had a chance to be jaded. Um, what kind of response did you get from people when you, you really kind of broke the mold with Cooper and Fry? Well, I tell you, I know a lot of police officers and I, I always have done as a journalist. And, um, I remember when they first started reading my books, the, one of the first things they said was, thank goodness somebody's writing a series of novels where the junior officers do all the work. <laughs> because <laughs> that's the way it is in real life you know it's not like it's not like tv <laughs> um you know we as the detective constables or sergeants in this country they do all that work uh, not the bosses so I, I sort of stumbled into getting that right as far as police officers were concerned but those two characters being young meant uh, readers all around the world had quite a different reaction to them than the way they did to some of those grumpy middle-aged men. They felt much closer to them because they cared about what happened to them, particularly um, Ben Cooper, who at the beginning of the series, he's quite, he's, you know, he's very young and he's quite a, a naive, um, immature guy, you know, yet, and yet people just fell in love with him because he was trying to do the right thing all the time, you know, not necessarily getting it right. And um, I found women in particular just fell in love with Ben Cooper in a big <laughs> way. <laughs> and I got so many emails from, you know, 15-year-old um, girls were writing to me to say uh, how much they liked Ben Cooper and they didn't think his latest girlfriend was right for him, you know, <laughs> all, <laughs> all that sort of thing just seem to have such a different appeal from the the old middle-aged guys you know uh so funny um what is what does the dynamic of having ben and diane uh working together uh what does that afford you as a writer uh and we've talked about the the lone grizzled um you know uh, borderline alcoholic uh uh, you know, detective who who uh, almost has a nihilistic uh, you know, attitude uh, toward solving crimes, uh, but having this this young couple, but but a uh, a man and a woman uh, to what does that afford you as a writer when when working not only the relationship between them but uh, the 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 process of their work? Mm, well, the the relationship between. Uh, ben Cooper and Diane Fry, uh, which has become a very complex one now over right. <laughs> the course of 17 years. As it books, should. <laughs> <laughs> has, um, has been one of the factors which brings readers back to, you know, to read more and more books in the series because they want to know what happens next. You know, how, how this relationship will develop or be resolved in one way or another. It keeps readers, you know, fascinated. <laughs> and, um, for me, it's one of the things that she's enabled me to write a long series, as I am doing, because I can keep the dynamics of the relationship changing constantly, because they started off both as detective constables. Gradually, over the course of the books, they, you know, one or the other has been promoted, and it changes the relationship. So Diane, for quite a while, was Ben's boss, which made a very, very different 
working relationship between them. So those those books had a different feel from the ones that had, had gone before them. And I can keep that constantly moving along. You know, they get a bit closer together and then they have to work separately. So uh, having started with that relationship, it's enabled me to keep the series changing and hopefully be constantly fresh with each with each book. Whereas I remember, um, just as an example, are you familiar with the Inspector Morse yes. series, Colin Dexter's mm-hmm. series? I remember his first book, he made um, Inspector Morse uh, approaching retirement age in the first book of the series, which meant that poor old Morse had to stay approaching retirement age right through the series. <laughs> he wasn't able to age or develop in any meaningful way. Whereas my characters have, they've, they've aged and things have happened to them. They've formed relationships and moved house and all that, all that stuff has, has happened over the course of the, the series. And it started with that, that initial idea of having these two young people just setting out in their career. Um, I think we, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that, uh, this is the 17th, uh, Cooper yeah. and Fry mystery. Wow. Uh, <laughs> what an amazing run. Um, you are, you're, uh, releasing, uh, one of these probably just about every year. Is that right? That's right. Yes. In fact, okay. the, in fact, the 18th one has, has just come out here in the UK. So nice. there's another book to follow. And I've been writing one a year. And, and you know, I, I had no idea that was going to happen. When I wrote that first one, that Black Dog, the first book, um, you know, I had ideas for a second one. But, you know, if you'd asked me then, how long is this series going to last? I would never have guessed at 17 or 18 books. But, well, that's probably a gift, too, because who who wants to carry that burden around <laughs> <laughs> from the beginning? <laughs> I would, yes, I would have panicked, I think, at that point. <laughs> we want you to write 18 books. I would have said, no way. Yeah, <laughs> like, but I have things but, to do this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, over the, and it's, it's quite astonishing when I think back about it, because sometimes, you know, my publishers would have come to me and said, Oh, we want you to write another three books in the Cooper and Fry series. Here's the, here's the contract. And I've always happily, you know, just signed the contract, having no idea really what any of those three books would be about, apart from the fact that they would have these two detectives in them and be set, you know, around the, the, the Peak District, which is where they, where they work. Um, and I, it's because I've always had complete faith in my characters. Um, they feel so real to me that I know, you know, that there'll be something happening in their lives next for me to write about. And it's the way those characters have developed over the series, which has kept me interested in writing about them. Because the only way I can find out what happens next to Ben Cooper is by writing another book. <laughs> 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 and, and it's entirely due to, to them that, you know, I've, I've been interested in writing so many books. Well, when you approach the next book project, when it's that time of year to start working on the new book, mm-hmm. uh, what comes to you first? Is it uh, is it a a situation that uh, uh, that Cooper and or Fry find themselves in? Uh, is it mm-hmm. is it maybe a, a headline from the news that you think, oh, this would be a great uh, you know plot scenario? Um, kind of how does how does each new project form to you? Uh, I usually have some ideas for um, an opening scenario, which given the sort of books they are, will involve a dead body or <laughs> or a murder happening somewhere. And for me, the, the location is very important. Um, the Peak District has played a huge part in these, these books. The, um, the locations are very, very important for readers and I'm, I'm conscious that Whenever a new book comes out, uh, a lot of them will actually go out into the Peak District to try and find every single location that I've mentioned. It's, you know, it's a real obsession for, for some crime readers. Um, so I will choose a place which will have a particular atmosphere and character of its own, which you know helps to give a different feel to each book. Um, and I'll have the idea for some characters too. 
who belong in that place. And I, and I put them into this opening situation where there's a dead body or whatever it is. I don't have a plot. I never, I never plan a book in advance, so I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know who did it or whatever that is, uh, how a book will end. I just start with this situation. And I think this is the, re- the reason why we write about murder so much is that it puts your characters into a situation where they're under pressure and they have to react in some way. And what you do is watch how your characters behave, um, see what they do, have they got something to hide, you know, what was their relationship to the victim. And as you write about them, that you then discover who these characters are. And they create the story for me. Just by watching what the characters do, I discover the story as it goes on. So in that, in those early stages of writing a book, I actually have no idea what it's about. Uh, does, <laughs> does that make sense? I sometimes yeah, oh, absolutely. It, <laughs> no, no, it, it absolutely makes <laughs> sense, and um, uh, I, I think that's that's the exciting part about being a writer is is these uh seeing what these people that live inside uh, our heads are going to do and um uh, and i think that's why a lot of writers are so hesitant to outline uh very deeply because you you tend to lose the the magic of the discovery as you're writing absolutely i i think it's a much more interesting and exciting way of writing than than knowing exactly what was going to happen all the time i think i would lose interest a bit but I think I'm very lucky that I'm writing about police detectives because the way I see it is it's their job to go out and find out what happened, not mine. They're the detectives. I'm just the writer. <laughs> and I, I rely on Ben, Diane, their colleagues to do their part of the job. And I've got such faith in them. I've, you know, I've written 18 books about them and I know they're going to do it again. Um, do you ever have any input uh, from uh, from real detectives or law enforcement uh, folks? Do you ever run up on a situation and, and you may say, I, I really need to, to understand how a professional would do this, not just how I think they would do it? Uh, sure, yeah. And I said earlier on, you know, uh, an ex-journalist, I don't, I don't know anything about anything really. So <laughs> if, I'm, <laughs> if I'm writing about a subject, I often need to ask ask somebody for the information that I need. So I've got a good relationship with the with the police at Derbyshire Constabulary, which is the police force that Ben and Diane work for. Uh, they're very helpful. They'll give me any information that, that I need. Forensics, you know, I, I don't know anything about forensics, really. So <laughs> if I need some forensics detail, I can go to people and, and ask them. But at the end of the day, uh, I'm not really writing authentic police procedurals that's not really what my books are about the technical side of a police investigation i'm interested in the characters and the story so i'm aiming for what i call um believability rather than total authenticity now there is a difference i think if you tried to be too authentic that would weigh the book down with too much technical detail so I, I just, you know, use a little bit of authenticity to try and make it all feel as though, you know, you can believe in this world. Uh, but, it, but I find most people, you know, are very happy to talk to you about their job or their area of expertise if you approach them and ask them for a bit of information. Yeah, that, that's been my experience, too, is people are, are usually more than happy to, uh, especially because uh, professional people and, and, and law enforcement, especially, um, you know, get get painted uh, aside from things that happen in the news. But if you just watch, you know, television shows and uh, most people groan and <laughs> cover their face when it's like, that is not what, you know, goes on. So I found that, that most people are more than happy to kind of set the record straight yeah, and, uh, yeah, and give uh, the real. Absolutely. View. Um, yeah, yeah we, we still have, you know, what we call the CSI effect here. <laughs> and <it's, Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> where, you know, everybody thinks it's, it's, it's just so easy. You got all this wonderful, uh, technical equipment in this modern lab where you can find out, you know, what you need to know in an instant. And right. uh, it, it just isn't like that. Uh, and, and police officers have, do have trouble with that. You know, they 
when they take a case to court, um, juries just can't understand sometimes why they didn't do a DNA test, for example. And they say, well, look, we've got all this other evidence to identify the suspect. We don't need DNA. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, juries say, well, CSI, they always do the DNA. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and it can be frustrating, I think, for, you know, police officers and forensic uh, people as well. For sure. Um, Stephen, we, we've mentioned the Peak District uh, a couple of times and that the, the books are set in the Peak District when, and that, that setting, uh, in particular, makes your novels a very different experience than, say, uh, if uh, if these were mysteries set in London. And and I've never been to the Peak District, but because of reading your books, I feel like uh, I feel like it's it's a place that 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 I love and that I would uh, that I'm familiar with because of the. Uh, the details that you put in and like you talked about the people that are kind of rabid fans and, and want to go, uh, you know, find all the locations and, and things like that. Um, why did you choose the Peak District and what do you think that, uh, that that setting, uh, gives you that allows your books to be so different? They, when I first started out writing the Cooper and Fine, I was the, the other thing that I wanted to do was to break down this, um, division that I saw in crime fiction at that time. Um, if you picked up a crime novel that was set in a, a rural area, in a village or a small town, you expected something quite cozy. Uh, you know what I mean by, by a cozy. Yeah. This sort kind of, of like a, a murder she wrote yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I would think of so Agatha Christie country house right. sort of tradition sure. here. Um, and all the darker, grittier crime fiction at that time was all set in the cities. And, you know, and I thought to myself, well, it doesn't have to be like that. You could write about a rural area, but have a darker feel to it and deal with serious contemporary issues. And, and that's what I set out to do. I wanted to break down that, that barrier between the two sort of halves of the, of the genre. And the Peak District was just a perfect choice of setting to do that because it has all these, um, a wonderfully atmospheric locations for me to use quite a, a wide range of, of different settings and all the thousands of years of history that are right there in the landscape and all the folklore and mythology that goes with it um, it's a very beautiful place it was our first national park here in the UK but I always have a sense that it's quite a dangerous place as well because there's always a, a sense of darkness lurking underneath the surface even in the sort of prettiest quaintest village if you do a little bit of research there's always quite a sinister history you know because there are thousands of years of, of, of history there um, and I just felt it was exactly the right place for me to write that sort of book I remember I don't know if you remember a Sherlock Holmes story called uh, The Copper Beaches um, which is set on the south coast of England and um, Dr. Watson and, and Sherlock Holmes travel out on the train from London and Dr. Watson makes a comment about how nice the countryside looks from the train window <laughs> and uh, I remember this so well. Holmes says to him something like Watson, there is more evil in the smiling and beautiful countryside than in the vilest alleys of London and that just captured what I was trying to write about, and, really. And and you took that as your 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 standard uh, that that you bear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it amazed me you'd said it all those years before, you know. And I just came across it and I thought, that oh, well, that's it. That's what I'm writing. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, Stephen, I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do. Uh, the new book, Dead in the Dark, is out, uh, available everywhere now. Um, and this is the 17th. You said you have the 18th that's, that's, uh, releasing in the UK and then yeah. we'll get that across the pond next year, I'm assuming. You will, yes. Excellent. Well, I, uh, I cannot wait to see what comes next. Um, so are you working on the 19th book? Uh, I, I have another book underway. It's going to be something different from the Cooper and Fry series. I'm just taking a little break. So it'll be something a little bit different, something I've had bubbling under for a while and just felt I needed to write. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, Steve, Stephen, God forbid if people are just now learning about you and, and <laughs> getting connected to your work, uh, where can they find you online to maybe read more about you, get into your back catalog and all of that good stuff? Yeah, sure. My website is uh, stephen-booth.com. That's st- Stephen with a P-H, stephen-booth.com. Excellent. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, everyone go out and get your copy of Dead in the Dark, a Cooper and Fry mystery, number 17 in the series. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Hank. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. His body broke free of its paralysis and he stumbled forward, losing his balance. He fell down the slope towards the spot where they had been. His hand shot out unthinkingly and he grabbed the corner of the black stone bridge. Hoofbeats. Pounding hoofbeats. Coming closer. Coming up the road. Someone or something galloped towards him. The head of an emaciated horse burst from the gloom of the road. The rider was fumbling, out of control, without saddle or bridle, clutching at the white mane, kicking the beast across the hindquarters with his thin legs, his face a frozen mask of terror. He whipped around to look back over his shoulder. Something chased him. Something terrible. Jason spun away as the horse ran over him, spearing him through the chest with its iron-shod hooves. He was unhurt. The horse galloped upward and across the bridge, across strong timbers rough-hewn and not hold. The rider wheeled the horse about, looking back from the far shore. He was wheezing. A sloppy, white ruffle bobbed under his chin. His face was hopeful now. A familiar face, much like the one Jason saw every morning in the mirror. Something thundered up behind Jason, not with a clatter of hoofbeats, but with the teeth rattling thunder of stone on stone. Ichabod, yes, of course, the man was Ichabod, wailed, and the sound of his terror echoed across the valley. The hot breath of a horse burned the back of Jason's neck. He stood frozen, unable to turn his head to see the thing behind him. He didn't want to. This was no ordinary vision. He felt with certainty that the rider behind him, no, the horseman behind him, knew he was there. Ichabod kicked his horse. It reared, brayed, and would have thrown him, but for the fistfuls of its mane he clutched. Horse and rider spun in place on the far side of the bridge, disoriented. The horseman behind Jason laughed, a terrible, deep, cracking sound from all directions like a thousand axes chopping down the woods. Jason felt searing heat as a ball of flame whipped over his shoulder. A burning jack-o'-lantern arced across the bridge. Its maniacal face spun end over end. It grinned back at Jason for an instant, spun around and crashed into Ichabod's temple, knocking him from his horse and into the dust. The pumpkin careened upwards, exploding against the trees, shooting tendrils of flame up their trunks, igniting branches and showering the world with sparks and flaming leaves. Jason recoiled, fell to his knees, and threw his arms over his face. His lungs and heart pumped wildly. They slowed. He brought his arms down. The bridge was broken again. It was over. 